What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Just One Man, the podcast taking the Sunday school stories that you heard a little bit deeper, hopefully hopefully giving you some insight, drawing you closer to God so that you can have a better relationship with Him and do kingdom work. Last week, we did the flood story. We started off, uh, we studied like the reasons for the flood, and so now we're to the point that we can move into the story. And that story begins with just one man, and his name is Noah. So Genesis 6, uh, verse 8, it says, But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. These are the records of generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time. Noah walked with God. Noah became the father of three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in the sight of God, and the earth was filled with violence. God looked on the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. So if you remember last week um, on the show, you know, we had discussed that the earth is filled with sinful men because they're all left to their own conscience to choose right or wrong. Like there really wasn't any law that was established uh, or anything like that. It was just really what each person, you know, felt. And if you've read the book of Judges, you know that just doesn't work out. And the reason why that doesn't work out um, is because our conscience is going to fail every time. The world's filled with violence. And even last week, like we were talking, even the demon realm had crossed a line. So God, in this moment, he's regretful that his work of creation has come to this. So he contemplates the world's condition and how to respond. And we're told that one man gains God's approval. Noah finds favor in the eyes of the Lord. And the word favor is shen, which is simply grace in Hebrew. So you could say Noah receives God's grace. And Noah is in the line of Seth, and so he's the seed line continuing from Adam. And if you remember, the seed line is just that line through which God will fulfill his promise. And this line will be men who know and follow the Lord. So knowing and following the Lord is something that only God can make possible through his grace. And here we see God taking that step again. He has intervened in the normal course of a man's life, brought faith into that man's heart so that he might receive God's grace. Once God's grace has rested on Noah, we see what follows in the next verse. Noah is called righteous, and he's called a righteous man, sorry, in verse 9, and Noah is said to be blameless in his time. And the Hebrew word for blameless, it just means without blemish, with integrity, um, upright. We're not talking about a perfect person, but we're talking about a godly person. And it says that he walks with God, meaning he's the man who knows and follows the living God. So it's really cool to look um, at the order of these descriptions. So first, Noah finds favor, or he receives grace. Secondly, he's declared righteous. And then third, he leads a godly life and follows the Lord. And that pattern, that's the pattern for all men who follow the Lord. Um, Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, the men of old gained approval. Noah, like all men, gained God's approval by faith, not by his performance. And it's been the same in Old Testament and New Testament. There's just no other way. So why is Noah in this position? By God's gracious, grace, gracious choice, and so that God may be faithful to his promise to bring a seed through men. Noah was the one through whom the seed promise would be fulfilled. Now you might remember that Noah was the tenth in the line from Adam. Numerology from the Bible, number 10 is a number of testimony, while 9 is a number for judgment. So the generations before Noah are wiped out by the flood. But Noah's family, the tenth generation, will live on as a testimony to God's grace. And Moses takes a moment to list Noah's sons because these sons had been born before the flood. Moses is singling out the family of Noah to make a point here. 
you have Noah, and you have his three sons. And the culture of the times listing the men implied their wives too. So you have four men, you have four women, so a total of eight. So eight people are listed in the genealogy of Noah. And by contrast, the rest of humanity, well, they're corrupt. Notice the language there in verses 11 and 12. It is complete without exception. All flesh is corrupt, filled with violence. The sense is that there's nothing worth redeeming other than the eight in Noah's family who received God's grace. So having introduced Noah and his family and explained why Noah escapes the judgment, we now hear the commission God is going to give to Noah. Now we pick back up in verse 13. It says, Then God said to Noah, To the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. And behold, I'm about to destroy them with the earth. Make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. You shall make the ark with rooms and shall cover it inside and out with pitch. And this is how you should make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits. Its breadth, 50 cubits, and its height, 30 cubits. You shall make a window for the ark and finish it with and finish it to a cubit from the top. And set the door of the ark on the side of it. You shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. So Noah, he receives his famous call to build this ark. And first, God gives Noah the reason for this calling. The end of all flesh has come. And so this announcement begins the 120 years that God decreed earlier. In this period of time, God is going to give Noah time to prepare the ark collect food, collect animals, and to enter into it. Now we see that the point of the delay is so that a time of preparation can take place in the meantime. Uh, we talked about last week, the story of Noah is a shadow for a later time in judgment, and many of the details of this account are intended to foreshadow the coming judgment of the Lord's second coming. And we see we see another of those shadows. The shadow is explained very clearly by Peter in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 through 10. Peter writes, Know this first of all, that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts, and say, Where's the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of the water and by the water, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. So Peter says those who ignore the signs of the coming judgment are forgetting the lessons of Noah's flood. God isn't slow in keeping his promise to return and judge the world. In fact, he's patiently waiting so that none of his children will perish. Just like he patiently waited for Noah to build the ark to save his family, God is waiting now. When the last appointed believer has entered the family of God by faith, then the end can come, because all the righteous will be safe. In Noah's day, the righteous were saved by entering the ark. In our day, we're saved from judgment by entering Christ. And that way, we begin to see that the ark itself is a picture of Christ, something that we'll dive into a little bit more as we go through this story. So God says all flesh must come to an end. Flesh refers to all living creatures with the breath of life. So land animals and man. And God says he's going to destroy both of them and the earth itself. And so we got to wonder, well, what would the animals do? Why are they caught up in all of this? 
Well, all the earth was placed under the same curse when Adam sinned, when Adam and Eve sinned, right? And both the land animals and man came from the dust of the ground. So both are suffering the effects of sin. Here we also see clear evidence that the animal kingdom is part of the earth created for man. And if man is to be destroyed, then animals have no reason to exist apart from serving man. The only animals that are going to survive are those that accompanied the family of Noah. So Noah is told, construct an ark. The word ark in Hebrew is literally a chest or a box. Uh, it's, the same word to, to, it's the same word used to describe the basket that Moses floated in as a baby. But other than that, it's never really used for anything else. Only after Noah heard the dimensions would he have realized that this wasn't going to be an ordinary box. But you got to wonder, why does God call it an ark? Why don't you just say build a boat? Well, simple answer is that a boat didn't exist in Noah's day. There's no evidence that man had ventured off the land. You got to remember, all the land is still connected. Uh, there's no need to get in a boat. There wasn't anywhere that you couldn't travel by land. Traveling by boat just led you back to the same land. And fishing was pointless because people didn't eat fish yet. We still ate plants. So there's no word for boat, nor would Noah have even understood what that meant. So we can also assume that the exact manner of construction was something Noah received from God as Noah progressed through the project. He may have had a great skill in woodwork. We don't know. But we can assume he still would have needed some outside experience to construct something on this scale for the first time. The ark itself, I mean, is really quite impressive. I think there's a replica of it in northern Kentucky that you can go and visit. But it's 450 feet long, it's 75 feet wide, and it's 45 feet high. So it's like a four-story building that is the length of one and a half football fields. It has three decks in it. Um, it's 100,000 square feet, a million cubic space. It's like 800 railroad boxcars. Um, in appearance, it was a floating box. Very stable, almost impossible to capsize, especially when you know it was loaded up. And we don't know exactly what gopher wood was, so the type of wood is a little bit of a mystery, but it was to be covered inside and it was it was to be covered inside and outside with pitch or kofer. And the ark was covered with pitch or tar to make it waterproof and to seal the wood so it wouldn't uh, become waterlogged, waterlogged or leak. And obviously that's an essential step because if the boat wasn't watertight, then even after it began to float, it would eventually sink into the judgment waters. So interestingly, the word kofer is the same word for atonement in Hebrew. So the ark provided salvation for Noah and his family from God's judgment of sin, of the world's sin. And key component that made Noah's salvation possible was the covering, the kofer or atonement, that ensured that they would remain safe when judgment came. Again, the ark is becoming a greater picture of Christ for, you know, Christ is our atonement for sin. Were it not for Christ's atonement, we wouldn't stand a chance when God's judgment fell. But if we are in Christ, like Noah was in the ark, then we're protected by Christ's atonement. Now, at about this point, Noah was probably wondering why he needed to build such a large, we'll just say ship. And the Lord answers that. In verse 17, it says, Behold, I, even I, am bringing the flood water upon the earth to destroy all the flesh in which is the breath of life. From under heaven, everything that is on the earth shall perish. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every kind into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Of the birds after their kind, and of the animals after their kind, of every creeping thing on the ground after its kind. Two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive. As for you, take for yourself some of all food which is edible, and gather it to yourself, and it shall be food for you and for them. 
So God gives this explanation that his judgment will take the form of a flood of water on the earth. Uh, it must be water because God is intent on taking away the breath of life. Obviously, breathing will end when the flood comes. This is not to say that there's no collateral damage to sea creatures, but they're not extinguished in the same way as land animals were. As God describes this event, he uses a unique Hebrew word for flood used only of the um, of this event. The Greek word used in the New Testament for Noah's flood um, is also unique. In both cases, these words are not normal words used for local floods. They are specific to a worldwide event, something unparalleled. So one question to consider at this point is, why does God use a flood to take everyone's life? Well, since the Bible says that God must actively uphold life or it would end instantly, Colossians 1.17 says all things are being held together by Christ's creative power. If God wants to destroy life, couldn't he just make it happen instantly without using a flood? People and animals would just drop dead except for Noah's family? Well, obvious answer is of course he could. But there are at least three reasons why God does it with a flood instead. First, the flood gives opportunity for God to create the pictures and shadows he wants so he can teach concerning the final judgment. Second, the flood waters become an effective mechanism to bury the carcasses of so many of the dead men and animals. The mass burial of all of these living creatures, um, became, I mean, those become fossils and we see today in um, geological records. And third, the forces required to create the flood will tear apart the world. Continents will be reshaped. Climate will change. Um, natural features like mountains, oceans will become barriers. And these changes, along with others that come after the flood, will support God's purpose in making it harder for man's sin to escalate out of control again. So since the news, this news must have been disturbing to Noah, God also gives Noah some assurance that not all is lost. God will preserve Noah and his family because of a covenant. When Noah leaves the ark, God will enter into a covenant with Noah later in Genesis chapter 9. And this is the first use of the word covenant in the Bible. Though it doesn't mean that this is the first covenant in force, We've already seen God make promises, which are basic elements of a covenant. Finally, God gets to the most memorable and incredible part of this whole commission. Noah will bring along a smorgasbord of land creatures. He will ensure that a male and female of each will be included. But notice how God says they will find their way to the ark. In verse 20, God says these animals will come to Noah. So if you've ever wondered how Noah could collect so many animals, here's your answer. God directed them to Noah once the ark was ready. Also remember that all the land is in one place, so all the animals live on the same continent. Some might discredit this story of Noah on the question of, well, how did he fit so many animals in the ark? Well, People have really overestimated how many species or kinds of animals there are. Kind is a much broader word than species and reflects the way God made animals originally. One kind would eventually diversify into many subkinds or species. So Noah only needs to preserve one pair of a given kind to ensure many subkinds will eventually exist after the flood. Now, excluding sea creatures and plants, there's probably only about 200,000 species of animals and insects in the world. And if we assume that only two species per kind, we could easily put 100,000 animals in the ark and have 30% of the boat left over for people and food. But why don't the lions eat the zebras? Well, because like us, they all still eat plants. Remember, the animals don't have this predator-prey relationship yet at this point. This won't be established until Genesis chapter 9. So 
Finally, we see Noah's reaction to God's instructions. Verse 22, it says, Thus Noah did according to all that God had commanded him. So he did. Noah is perhaps, I mean, this is a really remarkable person that's in the Bible. Sands Jesus Christ, right? In three chapters that cover the flood account from front to back, God speaks to Noah seven times. In all that time, the Bible records Noah speaking back to God exactly zero times. Noah's never recorded to say anything back in response to God's instructions. So, I mean, it's just like, hey, he heard this thing from God, and then, okay, great, well, that's what I'm going to do. I mean, no, nobody else receives so many revelations and instructions from God and just says nothing in response to them. So Noah listens, Noah obeys, he doesn't question, he doesn't argue, he doesn't make excuses, and he probably had one of the most difficult assignments in all the Bible. And he said not a word to question the instructions. He just obeyed all that the Lord commanded him. The only thing the Bible ever says about Noah's response is what we see in verse 22. Noah did all that the Lord commanded him. In fact, the Hebrew in this verse is repetitive to emphasize Noah's utter obedience. He's arguably the most obedient man in the Old Testament. Um, other men received much easier instructions like Jonah or Gideon, but they questioned God or just rebelled entirely. I think Noah is so amazing just because the combination of how great a thing he is given and just how perfectly that he obeys. Even when he was facing, I mean, the most extreme and difficult instructions, I mean, remember, he's called to build this giant boat when there weren't any boats in a world that hadn't seen rain, and he just did it without any hesitation. And now add to the fact that there's no evidence that God spoke to Noah again during this 120 years, I mean, could you take God's instruction and obey them without questioning it for decades, if not millennia? I mean, some of us can't even do it for a day or five minutes. I mean, this is what, a, what a, I mean, just a perfect example of faith right here. And often when people ask how they know when it's time to leave or time to move on, I mean, you can just simply look at Noah. Do the last thing you heard God tell you until you hear something else. I mean, we could do worse than to model our own obedience after Noah, especially since obedience um, isn't valued today the way the Bible values it. Okay, so it's time to enter the ark. Genesis chapter 7, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Noah, Enter the ark, you and all your household, for you alone I have seen to be righteous before me in this time. You shall take with you every clean animal by sevens, a male and his female, and of the animals that are not clean, two, a male and his female, also of the birds of the sky by sevens, male and female, to keep offspring alive on the face of all the earth. For after seven more days I will send rain on the earth forty days and forty nights, and I will blot out from the face of the land every living thing that I have made. Noah did according to all that the Lord had commanded him. Now Noah was 600 years old when the flood of water came upon the earth. Then Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him entered the ark because of the water of the flood. Of clean animals and animals that are not clean and birds and everything that creeps on the ground. There went into the ark to Noah by twos, male and female, as God had commanded Noah. So in chapter 6, God said he would only strive with man for 120 years. Since the flood is now about to begin, we know it's been 120 years since God made that declaration. Now the ark is ready. God gives Noah new instructions for entering. Earlier, God had instructed Noah to bring two of every land animal. Here, God adds some new instructions to Noah that he should bring additional numbers, seven, of clean animals. While the Mosaic law had yet to be established, God has obviously revealed to Noah um, what were clean animals. So God's law, while not yet fully revealed, still existed and Noah was aware of it um, to, to at least some extent. So why 
does God ask Noah to bring these additional clean animals? Well, if we jump ahead in the story of Noah, we see the answer after Noah leaves the ark, Genesis 8 verse 20, it says, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. The moment God speaks to Noah in chapter 7 verse 1, we've reached a point on earth where there's none righteous but Noah and his family. The line of Seth, the seed of the Messiah, has been reduced to only Noah. Methuselah must have died at the moment of verse 1, so now the flood can come without jeopardizing the righteous. Only Noah is left. Consider the patience of God and the wisdom of his work through men. 969 years ago, God directed a father to name his son Methuselah, which means when he dies, it will come. God was at work planning a flood. Then 600 years earlier, God brought Noah into the world with the name Rest. And 120 years earlier, he directs Noah to begin building. 20 years after Noah begins building, he receives his three sons. God has set in motion all of these events so that on a day he appointed, they would culminate in the flood and the destruction of ungodly men. What is God doing in our lives now in preparation for something years from now or in your life? Obedience is defined as working God's plan instead of our own. But just as Jesus said, we must be willing to set down our own work first before we can pick up his cross and follow him. That's what Jesus says in Luke chapter 9, uh, picking up in verse 59. And he said to one another, follow me. But he said, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. But he said to him, allow the dead to bury their own. But as for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. Another also said, I will follow you, Lord. But first permit me to say goodbye to those at home. But Jesus said to him, no one, after putting his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. So speaking of timing, in verse 7, God announces that Noah and his family of seven must enter the ark because he will bring rain in seven days. This is the first time rain will have ever fallen on the earth. Until now, the earth has been watered with a mist, um, as was described in Genesis chapter 2. But God's about to change that pattern in a very dramatic way, which we'll take a look at here in just a second. But first, notice that Noah and his family are entering the ark well before the rain begins. Seven days, a week. They haven't seen anything change yet. Nothing would have indicated that this disaster God predicted would actually come about. So can we imagine how difficult that might have been for them to enter this giant boat filled with animals while the sun's still shining? Like, what compels someone to enter under those conditions? Well, obviously the answer is going to be faith. The world's filled with people, but God has declared that only eight of them are righteous. And we know that righteousness is not earned. It can only be given to us by God on the basis of our faith in the one who earned it on our behalf, Jesus. So Noah and his family are righteous because they believed they had faith in God's word. So what did they believe in? Did they believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ? Well, no, but they believed in the word that had been given them by God. They believed in reality. They believed in the reality of a coming judgment by floodwaters. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11 verse 7 says, By faith, Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen in reverence, prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, by which he condemned the world, and became an heir of the righteous, which is according to faith. So rain had not yet been on the earth, yet Noah and his family entered seven days early. So why did God let them in so early? So that there might be visible proof of their faith? If you didn't believe in the promise of God, you wouldn't enter the ark. You might consent to help build it, but if each mem member of the family hadn't personally accepted the truth of God's word, they would have never entered the boat under clear skies. Faith brings a response to God's word, and the response by Noah and his family was to enter this ark. It was a harder step than I think that we can imagine. 
and in no doubt brought great ridicule by those in the day. And each of those who saw them enter heard Noah's testimony that the end was near, but there was no longer any hope for any of them. Here we find another parallel and picture for future judgment. In the future day, perhaps a day very soon, those God has declared righteous will be removed from the earth for a short time, seven years to be exact. And those seven years will be a time of waiting for the world before judgment falls at Christ's return. The entering of Noah and his family into the ark, the world's entire righteous population, this pictures the rapture of the church. All the world's righteous are removed in an instant, gathered together with Christ, who is pictured by the ark itself. And we are hidden from the world for a period of seven years, and we are taken early as a testimony to the world so that we can escape the coming judgment. Okay, back to Genesis, chapter 7, picking up in verse 10. It came about after the seven days that the water of the flood came upon the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on the same day, all the fountains of the great deep burst open and the floodgates of the sky were opened. The rain fell upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. On the very same day, Noah and Shem... Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah, and Noah's wife, and the three wives of the sons with them entered the ark. They and every beast after its kind, and all the cattle after their kind, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth after its kind, and every bird after its kind, all sorts of birds. So they went into the ark, they went into the ark to Noah by twos of all flesh in which was the breath of life. Those that entered, male and female of all flesh, entered as God had commanded him, and the Lord closed it behind him. So true to his word, God brings this flood. Um, and we'll take a look at this from a couple of different perspectives. So like we'll examine the facts as they relate to the pictures and shadows that God is presenting through the story. Um, and either this episode or maybe next week, we'll take a look at the nature of the physical events themselves and how God accomplishes this remarkable moment. So in verse 11, the monumental significance of this event is emphasized with Moses' careful accounting of the day on the Jewish calendar. It was the second month, the 17th day of the month. Moses seems to be imposing the Jewish civil calendar onto the events of Noah's day based on divine inspiration. By that same calendar, Jesus resurrected from the grave on the 17th day of the second month. Again, Jesus is the ark, the one who saves us from coming judgment. And that saving work was done for us when Jesus was raised from the dead, proving his power over death. And Noah and his family were saved the day they entered into the ark. Though the flood water didn't come for another seven days, Noah and his family were saved um, the day that they entered. It didn't, it, it, mattered, it didn't matter what day the flood actually arrived. It only mattered that they were in the ark. Having entered, they were immediately saved from this future judgment whenever it decided to come. So notice that everyone entered on the same day, a particular day. There's a specific day appointed for them to enter. It's not enough to stand near the ark or lean against it. You can't come up short. You can't be half in and half out. Hebrews 4.1 says, Therefore let us fear, if while a promise remains of entering his rest, any of us, you may seem to have come short of it. The call of the gospel is an invitation to enter, but the invitation is all or nothing. And it comes with the same assurance that Noah's family received. Having entered our ark, which is Christ, we have been saved from the coming judgment. That's why Paul says, you know, so confidently, um, he declares Romans 8.1, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So, but there's only one way to enter this protection, though it's, you know, just one and only door. We can't make our own entrance. We can't devise our own plan. We can't hang onto the side of the ark. We can't climb on board later. The door is the only way in. And once the door is closed, there's no second chance. Uh, Jesus made the connection between the door and himself in, um, 
John chap at the end of chapter 9 and the beginning of chapter 10. Um, it says, And Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, so that those who do not see may see, and those who may and those who see may become blind. Those of the Pharisees who were with him heard these things and said to him, We are not blind too, are we? And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But since you say, We see, your sin remains. Truly, truly, I say to you, He who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way, he is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he pulls forth all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. A stranger they simply will not allow, but will flee from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus spoke to them, but they didn't understand what those things were which he had been saying to them. So Jesus said again, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. So there's only one access to salvation, and that's through Christ. There was only one way into the ark to save yourself from the flood, and that was through the door. Those who claim there's another way, they're like thieves and robbers hoping to jump over the wall. These men won't be recognized by the sheep who only follow the shepherd. Notice that the door of the ark was closed by God. There's no going back now. Family's not leaving the ark. Nothing can remove them, even their own doubts or their second thoughts. Just like our salvation in Christ is equally secured, for we are for we are in him, and God has sealed us with his spirit. Ephesians 1.13 says, In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. All right. I was hoping to get this done in two parts, uh, but it looks like we're going to have to do a part three. Uh, unfortunately, that's not going to be next week because I'll be traveling. Uh, so it'll be two weeks before we take a look at a different perspective of the story. But so far, I mean, I think you get the gist of it. Um, and we'll wrap it up with the next episode um, that we have that'll drop in two weeks. So thank you so much for listening to the show. Uh, I hope that you learned some things just from listening to this. I know that I certainly did. Every time I read this story and study this story, I always pick up something new from it. So it's just a really incredible story. I know sometimes with familiar stories, we tend to just like skim over them or we go into it with the mindset of, yeah, I already know what happens. Uh, but it's just so great to like go into a story and try to look at it with fresh eyes or pretend that you've never heard the story before and you know really ask God to reveal something new to you um, that that you hadn't heard before you hadn't taken away before so I hope that you picked up some stuff uh, maybe some new perspective on this story that you didn't have whenever you heard it in Sunday school when you were you know like eight um, so thanks so much for listening uh, if you want to support the show, there's a Patreon account, but again, that's not really what this is for. It's really just, you know, to help you have a deeper knowledge in scripture. Um, and I really just hope that that, you know, builds your relationship with God um, and brings you closer to him. I hope it helps you to be able to share your faith a little more with those around you. Uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter, you can. It is at BrandonTubbs24, um, or you can follow me on Instagram at OKistBrandon. Um, other than that, that's it. So I'll see you all in a couple of weeks. Um, thank you again. I really appreciate all the feedback. Uh, and I really appreciate the downloads and the listening. Um, feel free to leave a review or like give a rating. That's honestly the best thing that you can do because that'll just help other people have the same opportunity as you to be able to hear this also. All right. Until a couple of weeks, we'll see you then.